The raid on Darwin, also known as the Battle of Darwin, on 19th of February 1942 was the largest single attack ever mounted by a foreign power on Australia. It involved more aircraft than the famous Japanese raid on Pearl Harbour, and far more ordnance was dropped on the targets, but the material destruction was much less. This was partly because the defenders were better prepared, war having already been declared, but mostly because there were simply far fewer and far less valuable targets for the attackers to destroy. Over the course of the war, the Japanese conducted over 100 raids on Australia, typically against harbours and airfields, but the Darwin raid was the first and by far the largest, involving some 242 aircraft in two separate waves. The initial attack targeted the town, the harbour and the assorted vessels in it. The follow-up wave was aimed at the town's two airfields. Darwin was only lightly defended, and the Japanese inflicted heavy losses upon the Allied forces at little cost to themselves. Darwin was then, and still is, the capital of Australia's northern territories, but in the late 1930s it was a small town of less than 6,000 inhabitants. However, it had considerable strategic importance. It was within easy range of both Java and Timor, conveniently placed to reinforce either, and it straddled an air route that bypassed Japanese possessions in the Central Pacific area. Accordingly, in the run-up to World War II, both Army and Air Force bases were constructed near the town in the anticipation of providing stores and replenishment services for aircraft transitioning into the Central Pacific. When war came, the coastal defences were strengthened and the civilian population largely evacuated from the town. Allied planners intend to use Darwin as a major distribution hub. Supplies would be moved from Brisbane overland and then onward from Darwin via sea and air to Allied positions in Java and Timor. It soon became clear that the distances involved made overland transport impractical, and therefore supplies were instead moved from Brisbane by sea. Darwin's harbour soon became a very busy place. This increased activity was quickly picked up by the Japanese, and in January they responded by using submarines to lay mines outside the harbour. This impeded the movement of supplies, but events soon unfolded to provoke the Japanese into making a more active intervention. By mid-February, the Japanese had captured Ambon, Borneo and Celebs. Resistance had been much weaker than anticipated, and the Japanese were well ahead of their scheduled plans to create a co-prosperity sphere. The next phase of conquests had to be hurriedly redrafted. Although they had originally no intention of incorporating Timor into their East Asian co-prosperity sphere, Allied violation of neutral Portuguese East Timor made them change their minds. They planned to land at Timor on the 20th of February and to follow up with a major invasion of Java soon afterwards. This brought Darwin onto the front line. Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto, Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Fleet, proposed an amphibious invasion of North Australia, but Japanese High Command rejected this. The subcontinent was too big and would require an immense garrison which they were not in a position to provide. Nonetheless, they agreed that if forces at Darwin had the capability to interfere with their invasion plans, they would have to be dealt with. On the 10th of February, a Japanese scout plane conducted a thorough high altitude reconnaissance of the area. It identified an aircraft carrier, actually the seaplane tender USS Langley, five destroyers and 21 assorted merchant ships in Darwin Harbour, as well as 30 aircraft at the town's two airfields. This was a substantial enough force to potentially cause difficulties for the invasion fleets moving on Timor and Java. Therefore, the Japanese decided to conduct a major air raid on Darwin to suppress the Allied air and naval forces stationed there. The defenders were far from unaware of the potential danger. Intensive Japanese air activity over Timor during the last few days had caused the Darwin air raid sirens to be sounded several times. A raid was expected although not as quickly or on the scale that was to come. The main Japanese force involved in the raid was the first carrier air fleet, the famous Kido Butai. This was the heart of the force that had begun the war in the Pacific by carrying out the raid on Pearl Harbour. The hard core of the first carrier air fleet was the aircraft carriers Akagi, Kaga, Hiryu and Soryu, which between them carried over 430 aircraft, including spares. They were escorted by a powerful force of three cruisers and seven destroyers. Three submarines were also allocated to the force. The second Japanese force consisted of two groups of long-range land-based bombers. These were much larger planes, 
a squadron of 27 G3M Nell bombers flying from Ambon, and a second squadron of 27 G4M Betty bombers operating from Kandari in Celebs. The Nell was a twin-engined aircraft developed in the mid-1930s, when it was regarded as the world's best land-based naval bomber. Its bomb load was only moderate, but it had excellent range. The Betty was a progressive development of the Nell. It had slightly less range, but it was rather faster. Both were excellent attack planes, but the emphasis on range meant that their defensive weaponry and protection were minimal. Neither had armour or self-sealing fuel tanks, making them very vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire and especially enemy fighters. Fortunately for their crews, there was little of either at Darwin. Despite Darwin's increased strategic importance to the Allied war effort, the town was poorly defended. Radar was being installed at the time, but was not actually functional. Early warning of approaching aircraft was dependent on coastal watchers on nearby Bathurst Island, just to the north. The anti-aircraft defences consisted of 16 quick-firing 3.7-inch anti-aircraft guns and two 3-inch anti-aircraft guns to counter aircraft flying at high altitude, and a small number of Lewis machine guns for defence against low-flying raiders. The crews had conducted little recent training due to ammunition shortages. The Allied Air Forces at Darwin consisted of a grand total of three undersized squadrons, together with elements of a fourth. The first was number 12 Squadron Royal Australian Air Force, equipped with the CAC Wirraway. The Wirraway was a single-engine trainer plane, hurriedly pressed into service as a make-do fighter bomber and short-range reconnaissance asset. It was slow and poorly armed, and in any case, none of the six examples at Darwin at the time of the raid seemed to have been serviceable. Number 13 Squadron Royal Australian Air Force was equipped with 14 Lockheed Hudsons, a maritime patrol bomber and general purpose utility plane derived from a civil airliner. A good number of these were also grounded, this time due to a shortage of crews. Three more Hudsons from Number 2 Squadron Royal Australian Air Force reinforced them the day before the raid, having been evacuated from Timor. The final unit consisted of 10 United States Air Force P-40 Warhawks from the 33rd Pursuit Squadron, which was in transit to Kopang, from where it was planned they would head on to Java. They were scheduled to fly off that very day. The P-40 was the main US Air Force fighter in the early part of the war, and with development served right until the end. It was a versatile aircraft, and in spite of theoretically mediocre characteristics, when used correctly an outstanding air superiority fighter, especially at medium altitudes. Unfortunately, the squadron available was a new one, made up of largely inexperienced pilots. There were dozens of vessels in the harbour on the day of the raid, most of them very small. The majority were anchored near each other, incapable of manoeuvring, making them easy targets for attacking aircraft. No plans had been prepared for how the vessels should respond to an air raid. The most significant fighting vessels were two United States Navy ships, the destroyer USS Peary and the seaplane tender USS William B. Preston. Peary was supposed to have escorted USS Houston to Java the previous day, but had been distracted by a suspected submarine contact. The destroyer searched fruitlessly for several hours before finally returning to Darwin to refuel. Owing to the lateness of the hour, it was decided to overnight in Darwin before setting off for Java the following day. There was also the large tanker British Motorist and eight assorted freighters, of which the most important were the troop transports Megs and Zealandia, and a freighter called the Neptuna, heavily laden with depth charges. There was also a depot ship called the Platypus, and a large hospital ship, the Manunda. The minor fighting vessels at Darwin consisted of two sloops, a corvette, and four minesweepers of the Royal Australian Navy. The balance of the shipping consisted of luggers, lighters, ketches, boom protection vessels and ferries. The USS William B. Preston had unloaded two of its Catalina flying boats to carry out maintenance on them. There was also a Cantor Empire flying boat, the Camilla. In addition to the vessels in port, two American Army supply ships, the Don Isidro and Florence D, were near Bathurst Island bound for the Philippines. The Japanese task force moved down from Celebs to a point east of Timor Island to fly off a massive strike of 188 aircraft on the morning of 19th of February. The strike was made up of 36 A6M Zero fighters, 71 D3A Val dive bombers and 81 B5N Kate torpedo bombers. The strike was led by Commander Mitsu Fushida, who had also commanded the first wave of aircraft that attacked Pearl Harbour. The Zero, official Allied reporter named Zeke, 
is the most famous of all Japanese aircraft and the main naval fighter plane of the first half of the Pacific War. Its heavy armament and exceptional agility, combined with the high quality of the pilots, made it a formidable opponent in a dogfight. It took some time for Allied fighter planes to understand the correct way to fight them. Their good characteristics were a product of a light airframe, which made them fragile and easily damaged, and unable to turn tightly at high speeds. The Aisha D-3A Val was the principal Japanese naval dive bomber for the first half of the war. Its flying characteristics were mediocre, but as in all Japanese aircraft, this was made up for by exceptionally well-trained and experienced pilots, able to get the very best out of the design. The Nakajima B-5N2 Kate bomber was the Japanese Navy's principal airborne torpedo delivery system in the first half of the war, although it also served as a conventional level bomber in ground support operations. It was an effective strikes plane, but its slow speed and pitiful defensive armament, a single flex light machine gun, made it very vulnerable if deprived of fighter escorts. February the 19th was a fine sunny morning, a perfect day for an air raid from the point of view of the attackers. It afforded them good visibility of their target area, while at the same time providing lots of glare to blind the defending anti-aircraft guns. On their way to Darwin, the raids escorting Zero shot down a US Navy PBY Catalina and strafed a United States Army Air Corps C-47 Skytrain on the ground near Melville Island. At 0935, Coast Watchers at the Bathurst Island Mission radioed into Darwin's Air Force Operations Room that they had just seen a large number of aircraft flying south towards Darwin. However, no general alarm was given until about 10 o'clock, as it was wrongly judged that these aircraft were the 10 United States Air Force P-40s, which had abandoned their flight to Copang due to bad weather and were returning to Darwin. In order to achieve tactical surprise, the attacking aircraft crossed the Australian coastline well to the east of Darwin, penetrated inland about 15 miles, and then looped round to commence their attack runs from the southeast from overland. The first indication of the raid came when Zero strafed the minesweeper HMAS Gunbar as she was passing the harbour Boomgate at 0957. Major Pell, in command of the Warhawks, sent half of his aircraft to form a CAP, a combat air patrol, over Darwin while the others refuelled. Unfortunately, the CAP was bounced by the raid's escorts and four were quickly destroyed. The fifth managed to shoot down one Zero before successfully disengaging. The initial Japanese attack was made at medium altitude by Kates acting as level bombers. These carefully crisscrossed the area, dropping their first pattern over the shipping in the harbour, while the second extended into the town itself, doing immense damage to infrastructure. Then the Val dive bombers and Zero fighters attacked targets of opportunity in the harbour. By now the alert had been sounded and heavy if rather ineffective barrage of anti-aircraft fire was put up. The two big US ships, Peary and William B. Preston, anticipating trouble, had maintained steam and so were able to get underway and manoeuvre in the harbour. Nevertheless, Peary took a direct hit from a large bomb and slowly sank by the stern. The sailors on the forward guns continued to fire as she went down. 88 of her 142 crew were killed. It was the Val dive bombers that caused most of the damage. They sank five merchant ships outright, including the magnificent 12,000 tonne transport to Megs, but the William B. Preston escaped with only minor damage. Three other transports, heavily damaged, had to be beached. Several minor vessels were also sunk or damaged. The two PBY Catalinas in the harbour were also destroyed, but smoke from a burning ship covered the Empire flowing boat. In the town itself, the shore end of the wharf was hit by a heavy bomb that killed 21 dockyard workers and blew a railway engine clean into the sea. The administrator's office, the police barracks and station, the post office and postmaster's house were all demolished. Government House, the civil hospital and the oil storage tanks were severely damaged. The Vals and Zeros then widened their operations. An army hospital nine miles out of the town was strafed and some Zeros attacked the RAAF airfields. Major Pell had scrambled his now refueled P-40s but they were caught by the raid's escorts as they were taking off and all five were destroyed. Pell himself managed to bail out but was caught in a burst of cannon fire and killed. Now free to shoot up the airfields, the Zeros inflicted considerable damage to both aircraft and buildings. Having expended all their ordnance, the Japanese planes retired. On their way back to the carriers, some of them passed over the freighters Florence D and Don Isidro, fixing their position for an afternoon strike. The entire raid lasted about 30 minutes. Rescue operations began immediately and were generally successful, 
but tragically the fires on that tuna could not be controlled and reached her cargo hold of death charges, causing her to explode spectacularly. An hour and a half after the end of the first raid, or just after midday, sinister droning heralded the approach of the second raid. Two formations of Japanese high-level bombers flew in from opposite directions at a height of 18,000 feet to drop their bombs in a series of tight patterns over the RAAF airfield. The Nels attacked from the southwest, while the Bettys came in from the northeast. The two formations timed their attacks to perfection and came over the base at the same time. They dropped their bombs simultaneously, then reversed course and made a second attack. The destruction of the P-40s meant there was little that could be done to stop the raiders. There were heavy anti-aircraft guns defending the base, but owing to defective fusing, they failed to damage any of the high-flying Japanese aircraft. Extensive damage was done to the airbase, wrecking the main hangars, the central store and the transport section. Casualties were thankfully light. Of the RAAF aircraft at the base, six Hudsons were destroyed and another and a Wirraway damaged. This second raid lasted barely 20 minutes. Later in the afternoon the Japanese carrier force launched a small number of VALs to attack the two merchant vessels the raid force had detected while returning from Darwin. Don Isidro was rapidly sunk 25 miles off Melville Island. 11 of her 84 strong crew were killed. Florence D was sunk off Bathurst Island with loss of four crewmen. No one knows exactly how many people were killed in the attack on Darwin. A great many victims were unidentified and a sizable number of military personnel seemed to have simply disappeared. In the confusion of the raids and the fear that there would be a Japanese landing soon afterwards, the ground crews at the airfields were ordered to move to a holding area to the south. Some of them allegedly deserted. The initial analysis of losses was made by the Low Commission in March 1942 and put forward a figure of approximately 250 fatalities. This is now generally believed to be an underestimate. Most authorities put the number of dead at slightly over 300, but there are some sources, including the then Mayor of Darwin, who claim it was much higher. There is less dispute over the number of injured, because, of course, the majority were admitted to local hospitals. Overall, about 400 people were wounded, about half of them were seriously. Because of the prior relocation of much of the civilian population, most of the casualties were military. Japanese casualties were minimal. A lot of Japanese aircraft received minor damage, but only four are definitely known to have been destroyed. One Zero was shot down by a P-40 and crashed near Melville Island, the pilot being taken prisoner. A VAL was destroyed by anti-aircraft fire over Darwin, and two other aircraft, a Zero and a VAL, were forced to ditch short of the carriers as a result of damage from flak. The crews from both planes were picked up by Japanese warships. The bombing of Darwin on 19th of February 1942 was both the first and heaviest single attack mounted by Imperial Japan against mainland Australia. Although the actual material damage was relatively not large, certainly by the standards of the Pearl Harbour attack, it was significant, particularly as there were so few assets in the harbour. The major military consequence was the loss of most of the cargo shipping available to support the Allied defences in Java and the Philippines. Java in particular was effectively sealed off from further surface shipments from Australia. This was certainly a factor in the swift fall of Java on March the 12th. The Japanese decision to attack Darwin was essentially strategically defensive in nature. It was not a prelude to an invasion, it was simply an attempt to prevent Allied interference with Japanese operations against Timor and Java. However, this was not known to the general public, and the raid was a severe blow to morale, causing much consternation throughout Australia. Coming on top of the then recent fall of the fortress of Singapore, the raid guaranteed that the Australian government would insist that no more Australian troops would be sent away from the subcontinent itself. This was to have far-reaching effects in the Desert War, as well as in Burma. The bombing of Darwin was the first of many Japanese air attacks. All told, nearly 100 raids were undertaken against Northern Australia during 1942 and 1943, no less than 63 of them against Darwin. Japanese naval aircraft, operated from land bases, also continuously harassed coastal shipping in Australia's northern waters during this period. Most of these attacks were small and had little tactical or strategic significance, but a particularly sharp raid on Broome in March 1942 destroyed 24 aircraft and killed 88 people for the loss of only two attacking Zeros. The Allied navies largely abandoned the naval base at Darwin after the initial 19 February attack, 
dispersing most of their forces to Brisbane, Fremantle and other smaller ports. They did arrange to build a large anti-submarine boom net across the harbour entrance. This, at six kilometres long, was reputedly the longest floating net in the world. Conversely, Allied air commanders launched a major build-up in the Darwin area, building more airfields and deploying many squadrons to deter future attacks. The destruction of so many ground oil storage tanks during the raid also led to the decision to construct an extensive series of underground oil storage tunnels in Darwin in 1943. Although the raid was uniformly successful, many Japanese commanders considered it an uneconomic use of their premium naval strike force. The scale of the attack on Darwin exceeded the Pearl Harbor operation. All told, 681 bombs totalling £215,500 were dropped on Darwin by 205 bombers. At Pearl Harbour, only 417 bombs totalling £251,000 were dropped by 233 bombers, although unlike at Darwin, the Japanese also dropped 40 torpedoes. Considering the paucity of targets in Darwin, the same results could easily have been obtained by a much smaller commitment of force. 